Hello. Welcome, everybody. I'm just going to give it a few moments while we let uh, folks trickle in. And we can get started really soon. <clears throat> Again, for those who are joining, just letting letting the the um, Zoom room do its thing and and letting folks trickle in. Welcome. Um, yeah, and I think we can get started here. Uh, just wanted to welcome you to um, Queering Digital Preservation. My name is Greg Stewart. I'm the Education Programs Manager. Uh, here at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCAHA as we call it. I use he, they pronouns, and I am um, a white person with glasses and brown hair, and behind me is a white wall with a bookshelf and some delightful children's artwork behind me. Um, just uh, a, a bit more about today's talk. Um, so applying a queer studies approach to preservation. Um, our speaker today, Richard Reinhardt, director of the Samic Art Museum at Bucknell University, um, asks, how can we shift our own institutional practices and policies in museums, libraries, archives, and galleries? This practice involves not only collecting digital artifacts by queer makers, but queering our own practices of digital preservation. Uh, and so Rick is going to present on this topic, and then we're going to have what we hope is really a nice kind of open dialogue where we definitely want to make sure we answer all of your questions. And Rick also has some questions for you to consider as well. So um, before we get to the presentation, just some Zoom housekeeping. You are in Zoom webinar, and your video and audio are turned off, but you can ask questions or make comments to us in the chat. Uh, this program is auto closed caption in English, and you can turn on subtitles with the little CC button that you'll see in your Zoom toolbar. Um, so like I say, we're going to have this presentation from our speaker followed by Q&A, uh, but please feel free to, to um, ask questions anytime during the program. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, the program is being recorded, and we'll send a recording as well as the PowerPoint and um, a bibliography uh, in, in a follow-up email. I do want to uh, thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the William Penn Foundation, and the Independence uh, Foundation who make today's program possible and allow us to keep it uh, free to you. Um, and just one quick note about the organization I work for, the CCAHA. We're a regional conservation lab and preservation services facility. We're based in Philadelphia, but we work with organizations and clients all across the country. Our conservators treat paper-based objects like books, photographs, documents, artworks on paper, and more. And our preservation services staff work in the field, providing educational programs like this one and helping institutions plan for the future of their collections. The center also offers a wide range of digitization services, as well as fundraising assistance, housing and framing, and more. Um, and you can learn more about us and what we do at our website, ccaha.org. So I'm, I'm excited to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Richard Reinhardt is the director of the Samic Art Museum at Bucknell University. Uh, he has served as digital media director and adjunct curator at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and as a curator at New Langston Arts for the San Jose Arts Commission. He juried for the Rockefeller Foundation, rhizome.org, and others. Uh, Rick has taught courses on art and new media at UC Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, and the San Francisco Art Institute, uh, Bucknell, and elsewhere. He served on the boards of the Berkeley Center for New Media, Langst New Langston Arts, and the Museum Computer Network. Uh, he has led the NEA-funded project Archiving the Avant-Garde to Preserve Digital Art, and has co-authored a book with John Apollito for MIT Press on collecting and preserving media culture called Recollection, Art, New Media, and Social Memory. Um, and full disclosure, Rick was my supervisor when I worked at the Samic Art Museum many years ago. 
Uh, so on a personal note, I'm just very honored and um, delighted that you're here today to present on this topic. So um, I'm going to turn off my screen, but but please take it away, Rick. Thanks, Greg. Thanks to you for inviting me and the Conservation Center for this series. It's been uh, really interesting so far. I hope to uphold that tradition. Um, for those of you watching, I'm a middle-aged white guy with glasses and a shaved head, basically a Gen X cliche. Uh, the remarks that I have for you all today are not comprehensive. This isn't a sort of beginning to end, sort of here's how I think you should, you know, query your collecting practices. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is just offer a few thoughts on the subject by way of kickstarting a conversation among us. So please be taking notes, if you will, um, and, you know, putting into the chat box for, for Greg to read aloud the questions and comments that you have later. Um, I have some visuals. You'll see the first slide has gone up there. Greg's going to be changing those. Thank you again. Um, and, but I just wanted to explain to everybody that I, this talk is not going to be where I sort of talk in depth about each of the works that's described in each slide. Most of the slides are just kind of there for background, and I'm going to be talking about something else. But, but those slides are all um, chosen because they're all artists that are dear to me. So in my world, my, my world of digital preservation is I work in an art museum. I'm an art curator. Um, and my, my research field of focus is digital art. So these are all works of digital or new media arts that I have worked with or collected, and there are a couple other slides thrown in. So I'm just gonna acknowledge each slide as it comes on, but again, the talk won't be about the works and the slides per se. This is a work by Jacob B. Satterwhite, Reifying Desire Six, and this is a fantastic multimedia piece. Uh, he's been shown, we were just talking before the Zoom chatted, I saw him at the New Media Museum in Amsterdam recently, he's been at the museum of modern art. So uh, yeah, his names are on the screen. You should look him up. He's really great. So let's get on to the remarks. <clears throat> As this group in particular knows, uh, an increasing percentage of our culture is born digital. And for that history to become part of the historic record, uh, it must be, well, first must be collected. And then of course it must be managed and preserved. Um, as, as again, this group knows better than most, this, this kind of preservation is urgent, both because of the nature of these works, I'm talking about born digital culture at this point, not just digital art, but born digital culture in general. Um, the preservation issues are unique, really um, brought on by the medium and uh, the preservation issues are urgent because of the scale, you know, the, the historic rapidity with, with which we've sort of collectively and globally moved over to a digital platform, um, you know, urging all of us in the cultural heritage sector to try and keep up with the pace of history. So these challenges require new solutions. Of course, many of the solutions and the ones I think we think of first are technical, um, but also what I propose is that we also need new solutions for institutional practices and uh, professional cultures. Those need to change as well. So my remarks here are not gonna really be talking about the technical solutions so much as those institutional practices and how those might change. I will go a little bit further in my assertion here and say that institutional critique should be a co-equal practice of digital preservation. So we have this urgent new moment in which we have, you know, this trans, this um, transformation to a new medium that we're collecting. So we have to rethink our collecting practices. Um, that's a good opportunity for cultural heritage institutions to consider our collecting practices more broadly. You know, if we're if we're redoing a policy or a procedure, let's rethink everything behind that that informs that as well. And. I mean that we should not only internally critique ourselves as institutions, um, but we should bring in a broader range of social critiques to bear on our sort of revisiting our own practices. And what I mean specifically by, or some examples of those kinds of instant broad social critiques that can be brought to bear on our institutional critiques are, um, Feminism, critical race theory, post-colonial theory, et cetera. These can all be brought to bear. Um, and they have been brought to bear to some extent already historically in critiquing institutions, including cultural institutions. And they have been brought to bear in critiquing more recently technology. Um, for a couple of examples of that, I'll mention um, things that people may already be familiar with. Um, 
Uh, critics have found that, for instance, the sensors in wa public washrooms at airports and bus stations and malls, those kind of sensors where you put your hand in front of the faucet to activate the faucet, um, those sensors often don't respond well to black skin. So there's an inherent technological bias that's built into the hardware. Um, airport security cameras and other airport security devices have been known, have been revealed to uh, exhibit racial bias and racial profiling in terms of, you know, uh, you know, sort of tagging individual passengers to pull aside for a search. In terms of a more sort of information universe rather than sort of the hardware universe, uh, I want to acknowledge the work of Wendy Chun, who's a scholar who has been working for many years to show how even big data is not neutral with regards to the kind of social identities and biases that we, that we experience in a larger society. What I'll focus on today then as, as a sort of even more fine example of what I'm talking about above is querying digital preservation. So looking at digital preservation through the lens of queer theory. Next slide, please. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into great depth about this work, but this is another fantastic artist that I've worked with, Porpentine Charity Heartscape. Um, and I encourage you all to uh, get the text down there below. This piece is called, um, I forget what that piece is called, but um, it's there on the screen. You should look it up later on. <clears throat> all right. So how do you, how do we queer our collecting practices? I think the first step actually often gets overlooked, um, especially by academics who want to appear very um, erudite and sort of move on to more nuanced and complex issues. But I'm going to take a step back and use my little moment of privilege here that I have, both as a museum director and as an invited guest in this public forum, to exhort all of you, all of my colleagues in the field, to do something very basic, and that is collect queer stuff. You just, that's the first step. Collect more queer stuff. Um, this historic moment that we're all living right now is characterized by the renewed culture wars. There has been, for a few decades now, an increased public acceptance of LGBTQ peoples and cultures, but there has also been, more recently, an equally culturally weighty uh, waves of reactionary legislation. So you could definitely say, whatever side of that fence you land on, that these kinds of cultural this, this cultural discourse characterizes our historic moment. So it makes sense, no matter what, for archives, libraries, museums, and the like to document that history. Part of that, I would say, would be collecting yeah, queer stuff. And uh, as we learned last week, archives are not neutral, so it's on us to decide how we're going to approach collecting this material. So let's go. Collecting queer materials it starts to queer the entire collection. As soon as you bring in queer materials, the entire collection gets queered in a couple of ways. The first of all is kind of the most obvious. When you're collecting works by out um, queer authors, artists, um, subjects, um, depending on what your archive collects, you're certainly um, starting to craft some queer representation in your collection. But there are ways even beyond representation to um, collect queer stuff and to start to queer your collection. For instance, in a digital context, um, there are artists who, for instance, work with operating systems and their project is to either invent queer versions of operating systems or to queer the use of an existing operating system in a digital artwork. What that does when you bring that work into your collection is it brings into question the social neutrality of that operating system and can, of course, reveal then the kind of cultural biases that I mentioned before. And then that raises the question of, of sort of technological neutrality and social neutrality in all of the other objects in your collection that use that same operating system or that same platform. So that's one way in which just bringing in even a small amount of um, critical queer material into your collection or archive can start to queer the rest of the archive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Zach Blass is an artist, excuse me, who does exactly what I'm talking about. And this is an example of his project, Queer Technologies, where he's invented a queer programming anti-language. So 
I guess what I'm trying to say here is that collecting queer material, or you could go into collecting queer material with the purpose of not just collecting some isolated instances of queer authorship to form a kind of representation, but you could also be collecting them fully aware and with the intent that these are also artifacts that recontextualize your entire collection. Because as soon as you start to incorporate queer material into your collection, then you also by definition have a straight collection and that changes everything. Next slide, please. This slide, for example, is um, a bookstore in San Francisco that I went to many years ago and I had a lot of queer material, but they were nice enough to point out that they also had some straight books in a separate section here on a shelf. I think this illustrates the point I'm making. Let me move into a new topic. What queer stuff demands of the institution? So when it comes in, it has some demands. In so much as archival materials or materials that are collected by archives are the unselfconscious byproduct of a person or organization. In contrast, artworks, the kind of digital artifacts that I collect, for instance, are made for the collection. They're self-aware. They come into the collection critical of their context. Uh, they demand a kind of agency. And when queer stuff like this comes into your collection, I think what it does for the institution is it cautions us against applying a kind of blanket digital preservation approach that may smother the queerness of particular objects. The variable media questionnaire, which uh, was developed by John Apollito, the co-author that um, Greg mentioned earlier and colleague of mine who was at the uh, Guggen Guggenheim and now he's at the University of Maine, he really um, brought forth the variable media questionnaire, which is again, if you just Google those three words, you'll find a lot more material on it, as a way to um, make, make part of the historic record and the institution's records for preservation, what variability is allowed in a digital artifact that's entering the collection. So what that means is when you're collecting a work, well, in our case, more sp most specifically of digital art, that, that you take the chance to interview the artist or the people around the artist, whoever participated in the creation of the object about um, what sorts of variances are allowed when you're preserving the work in the future. Because of course, with digital work, you're gonna have to port to new platforms and new media. You're gonna have to make decisions about how the work is going to change. It will change. That's another hurdle the institution just needs to get over is you can't freeze these works, the digital works in the same way that you could a marble sculpture. So if you're gonna have variability, you uh, the idea um, is that you interview the author or the artist about their variability and where they want it to go. Now, this variability of the work may be part of the queer strategy of the work itself. So all the more important to capture that. Um, and this, this, these queer strategies can allow the work to slant the universalizing effect of an institutional policy. Or in, in the phrase uh, coined by uh, scholar um, Victor Munoz, it, it, it could cause the work to disidentify with its context. So to both be collected by an institution, but to actively and sort of self-consciously disidentify with the rest of that collection as a subversive act. Obviously, um, these kind of strategies are easier for institutions that collect um, and catalog at the item level, like our museums or libraries, than they are for archives, which collect at the collection level. So you sort of need these broader strategies um, that sort of are applied to masses of object. But nonetheless, I mention them because I think they are directly applicable to item level institutions, and they could still inform the practices um, of archives and other collection level institutions. Next slide, please. The next um, thing I would encourage institutions to do after they started collecting queer materials is to identify those queer materials and authors and artists as such. Um, oftentimes that is not the case. There may be a lot of queer material in any of our collections already that is just not identified. And institutions have historically been hesitant to do that for a lot of 
a lot of the bad reasons that we might all imagine. <laughs> um, but there are actually a lot of good and easy and understandable reasons why museum, why institutions, museums included, are hesitant to do that, to go into a record and say, this is queer or that person's queer. Um, the first risk that we take is simply blunt tokenizing, right? I think museums are hesitant to sort of apply simplistic terms and labels to authors or objects that uh, reduce the intersectional identity of certainly of a person, you know, down to a hashtag. That's understandable. Another fear that institutions have is it, with regard to queer material in particular is that of accidentally outing um, or revealing too much about the artist or the author who may, who, who, whose identification they may have wished to hold closer um, or secret in some cases. Another reason why institutions are hesitant to apply these kind of labels or tags um, is cultural bias, the, the fear of cultural bias, which again, I think is a very real fear. And what I mean by that is um, that we sh rightfully should be afraid of uh, applying labels that describe sort of sexuality in ways that make sense to us in our culture and time, but may not make us that much sense to authors or artists or artifacts that were created in cultures much different than the one in which the institution is situated. Uh, cultures that are either geographically distant or remote or that are um, temporally remote, for instance. So these are all good reasons, but they're not reasons to do nothing. Standing mute on the sidelines does not serve scholarship or history in the long run. And we're, of course, you know, as it has always been with archives and institutions and museums, queerness must usually be read between the lines. Um, it's usually not structurally included. The verbal media questionnaire does exactly that. It says, here's some information about that's important that we're getting from the author that should be um, part of the metadata about the object. In the past, what we've had to do, I don't wanna say in the past, it's current still, it's the, major, it's the majoritarian practice that if you're looking for queerness in an archive, you have to basically read the full text bio of the author and you look for phrases you know, like unmarried, confirmed bachelor, spinster. Um, you're ba it's basically buried in these kind of full text resources and not called out in any way that is helpful for the researcher. I will add that the controlled vocabularies that we use um, in these like collection management systems are often not helpful. I'm gonna pick on the uh, AAT right now, the Art and Archite Architecture Thesaurus, which is used by many archives and certainly art museums. And I'll give you one example. Uh, so if you were to look up and then try to apply the term um, homosexual, which is its own, it's got its own baggage there, that term. But the, the, the point of weakness that I'm pointing out here is that in the AAT, if you look up homosexual, a subcategory and direct equivalent of that is queer. And that's not helpful because that does not reflect the current usage of those two terms. They're not equivalent terms. The AAT has them as equivalent terms. And in that hierarchy, they include no other equivalent terms uh, or synonyms. So in that sense, the controlled vocabularies are can be a little bit unhelpful. Um, so what I recommend is to get around this reticence is to adopt queer liminality. So instead of, you know, the label or the, you know, the field entry, the metadata element or the hashtag, you know, for instance, to pick on the AAT more, instead of hashtag homosexual being applied to a, a subject or, a, or an artwork, maybe we would try something like hashtag queer related or hashtag it's up for discussion. Just something that would indicate that there's something of interest here for a researcher of queerness. Rather than remaining silent, you don't need to reduce someone's uh, intersectional identity. Eve Sedgwick is um, an author and queer theorist who uh, coined the term nonce taxonomies, which I think is applicable to us because we deal, of course, in taxonomies in cataloging and describing our artifacts. Uh, and of course, what she means by this is eph ephemeral vernaculars, uh, languages that are temporally, sometimes briefly lived, very context sensitive, sometimes very geographically limited. I'm thinking of an example from, from the history of queer culture of Polari. Polari is, of course, the sort of secret language among queer people 
in um, early 20th century London, and it spread out from there to other largely urban centers. Um, but it was kind of a queer nonce vernacular, certainly a way of describing things that was both known to a certain group of people and unknown to a larger group of people who would have been hostile. Um, now, one way to sort of translate this idea of nonce vernaculars um, or nonce taxonomies to the digital context is to perhaps marry our controlled vocabularies to folksonomies. Uh, and you're, this group, of course, is probably familiar with folksonomies, but for those who may not have heard the term before, it's basically like a taxonomy, but it's drawn from, again, vernacular, the vernacular discourse. Um, it's sort of a crowdsourced controlled vocabulary, if you will. The group that Greg mentioned that I was, I have been involved in, uh, rhizome.org, did a project like this uh, many years ago, probably over 15 years ago at this point. And what they did was they have a collection called the Art Base, which is, again, these digital artworks, uh, and it's on a, in a big database online. And of course, that there's a collection management system. So what they did in this project was to uh, apply the controlled vocabulary to have professional catalogers apply these controlled vocabulary in the very traditional method to the artworks that are in the collection. And then they released those out to the public and they allowed the public at large to enter terms that they would use to describe those objects. So essentially they're sort of gathering or creating a folksonomy, a sort of extra layer on top of the collection management system. Um, I thought it was a really interesting project because what it did was to sort of marry the two. It didn't give up one in favor of the other. The hope was that you could retain the advantages of both, you know, a sort of long lived, well understood, controlled vocabulary, and then a much more um, context sensitive, but much more timely, uncontrolled vocabulary. Now, these changes, or I should say, these terms that were applied. Um, from the public could be, of course, as I described here, generated by the general public, but they could be contributed in um, by, by a little bit more select group. The variable media questionnaire in particular prompts catalogers to do that, to say, well, here's what the artist thought of something, but there may be other stakeholders. Um, you know, there may be the author, but also the author's co-creators or technicians who worked on the piece or the author's social cohorts who with whom that person talked to when they were creating the piece. <clears throat> so we need to work on our language. That's that's clear to me. Um, and and folksonomy seems like an interesting way to do that. Or again, coming from queer theory, the idea of nonce taxonomies. Since we're talking about authors and their cohorts, I think it's important to mention in the context of collecting queer material, either, of course, material that relates to queerness somehow or is as queerness as a subject or just comes from a, a queer person. Um, and that is family. So we need to talk about familial records in the context of, again, queer subjects. Um, queerness is something that is often historically hidden and not legally enshrined. And therefore, the records around a queer person, the official formal records of history may not reflect those relationships in the same way that they would reflect, you know, marriages and, and other types of family. Um, as we all know, a lot of queer people, most queer people don't come from queer families. It's a very different kind of identity in that your family usually doesn't reflect your that aspect of your identity. So a lot of queer people um, have gone out when they go out into the world, they find families of choice. Families of choice are just what they sound like. You know, it's basically your circle of friends, but it, it assumes a little bit more importance in queer communities because those, that's often your first tier support group rather than your family, who unfortunately, historically, sometimes have been hostile. Um, so those families of choice, again, since they're just friends, uh, they're often not sort of enshrined in the legal formal records of a person's life. Uh, but I think they bear equal, if not more importance to those other kinds of legal relationships to the author. Um, and I think it's important to sort of bring them in in the same way in a kind of structural explicit way into the record making around these objects. It could queer your collecting because it change it could change the way that we it, we inscribe and describe and thus the way that people study subjects like inheritance, dynasties, marriage, populations, domesticity. So there are a lot of reasons to again be more explicit about the queerness that we're collecting. Next slide, please. 
by way of example of this, I'm showing the uh, two, well, two sides of one gravestone. I'm showing a gravestone in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, uh, and it's the gravestone of Gertrude Stein, who's probably the more famous of the couple, you know, the famous queer author. Um, and what she did, which was rather genius, you know, is instead of, as would be the typical sort of American European tradition, you'd have a gravestone with uh, your name on it and maybe the family name and maybe the name of direct family relations. Uh, so what, what Stein did instead was to have the name of her lover, Alice B. Toklas, inscribed on the back of the gravestone. So I take this as a good, good example of what we could do in the modern 21st century and in our digital systems um, is make something which was historically not allowed and forbidden and hidden to reveal it and make it explicit. So in conclusion, um, I think I would offer the observation that queer cultures have no national homeland, no mother tongue, no historic creation story, and no center. Queerness almost always exists inside other cultures and other contexts. And as such, it has been characterized by emergence, liminality, ambiguity. These are traits that are anathema to the precision and precise practices of archivists and conservationists and catalogers, but they're traits that have been leveraged and in fact reclaimed by queer theorists. And as the examples above show, I hope, they can be useful when applied to queer preservation. Next slide, please. So thank you all. And now I'd like to open it up to discussion, questions. What my goal was in agreeing to do this talk was um, learn what you're all doing. I really wanna hear what's going on in the field. So I think first, let's just open it up and see what people have to say. Greg, take it away. Yeah, thank you. That was so inspiring. Thank you, Rick. Um, yes, uh, please, um, as as you're sort of processing and thinking about um, Rick's presentation, um, drop those drop those questions um, in the chat. Um, I mean, one thing, maybe just to get us started, I mean, I have a question for you, Rick, that I'm, it's kind of half form, so please forgive yeah. me, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, um, like on the one hand, the sort of archival impulse to like really document everything, and and um, and I think it's it's some of what you're kind of getting into in terms of the like, it's a discussion or queer leaning or things like that. But I'm also thinking about when when some of these labels like actively contribute to harm. So, um, like I was reading this article about, uh, do you know the composer Wendy Carlos? She's yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. yeah, like the first um, I think uh, Grammy nomin Grammy winner of trans woman composer, like electronic music pioneer. Um, I was reading an article that was very historical, very much about her early life before she was she transitioned. And it was dead naming her. It was like misgendering her. Mm -hmm. And like the co the comment section on this article were just like going off about like, how dare you? And I'm just thinking about like these two things kind of in 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 um opposition to each other, right? Like mm -hmm. this this idea to to make sure we're getting that historical accuracy in the record and then and not miss anything mm -hmm. um to when that that impulse maybe leads to to harm i don't know if you have like any examples of that that you've well, seen or just well, thoughts on that well not specifically of a of a data of a museum database leading to harm but what you're articulating is kind of what i was trying to describe in it's one of the factors in institutional hesitancy to applying these kinds of terms because exactly of that, you know, first of all, they're like, I'm just thinking of Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, you know, two titans of modern art who, who allegedly had a queer relationship, but never really talked about it openly. And it was, it's very unclear even after the fact later, you know, much, much after their deaths about whether they would ever want that to be revealed or not. So it's kind of there in the ether and it is important to history to understand that, but at the same time to, respect their wishes, if you were. Um, so that's that's one example of where people wrestle with this. But I think in the larger arc of history, 
what I would offer, uh, and, and I'm talking about specifically of queer history, is, you know, for, for much of human history, well, especially in sort of the European American and Western world, queerness has been hidden specifically as a strategy to keep queer people safe, right? This is why queer people invented Polari, so they could sort of talk about things that were important to them, maybe, and, and if they were overheard by, you know, a hostile straight society, they wouldn't know what was going on. And there are a million other strategies, you know, the hanky code, all these kind of secret codes that exist and have existed within queer culture as part of an overall strategy to sort of let us find each other and at the same time remain hidden and cloaked from the larger culture, which was mostly hostile. Um, but I think what history has shown is that the strategy of hiding by way of protecting yourself only goes so far. And the, the major advances in, in queer culture integrating with the larger culture, and you know that often takes the form of basically the larger het culture, het cis culture, basically becoming more accepting. The way that that has happened over the last few decades is that queer people stopped hiding themselves. That's what happened. That was the radical act. You know, that was queer liberation. It was like, we're out, we're proud, we're here, et cetera, et cetera. You all know, you all know the chance. And it's no coincidence that that move was then followed by a greater acceptance and greater safety. So I would say on the one hand, let's learn that lesson from history. The other is, yeah, with Jasper Johnson, Robert Rauschberg and all this stuff, you know, uh, you don't want to apply labels that either they wouldn't want or that might bring harm. So again, that's why, you know, you want to sort of interview the author if you can, when you're ingesting materials, like what are we allowed to do with this kind of stuff? But I also think we need these languages. We need new language. And, and there's a whole project that we could do where we spin off and decide, okay, well, what are ways to describe material that should be of interest to people researching queerness, but that doesn't dead name people, that doesn't out people. You know, I think you can do it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and I have a question for the group, if I may. Yeah, yes, they're a little uh, shy right now. So how about you ask your first question? Hopefully this will prompt some additional <laughs> okay. questions. Yeah. Well, my, my question is, um, which of you out there are using collection management systems that have space for or that prompt you when you're cataloging artifacts or creating records for people to describe people's identities, various levels of their intersectional identity in the way that we know, I, in the way that we talk about identity now and that is important for researchers, you know, so like race, class, sexuality, ethnicity, gender expression, you know, um, do your systems out there have places to put this data or um, are they, you know, are they explicitly prompting you to enter that? Because the, the systems that we're using don't. We sort of have to create a place for it. Is anybody out there using a system like that? And if you do, what are you putting in it? I'm also curious about that. What are you recording about people? There are so many levels to the identity of an artist or an author. Is anybody recording any of that kind of social identity information? A great question. Let's let's give people a few moments to type yeah. and and see see what what people out there are doing or, or what they're thinking about. Um, oh, here we go. Rainbow History Project uses Omeka, if I'm saying that right, and adds uh, this information and free uh, text fields. So the so Vincent has provided a link to to this resource. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Thanks, Vincent. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm part of a working group at Tulane working to create a guide to inclusive and rep reparative description. One of the controlled, oh yes, love the homosaurus, love the homosaurus. That's a great one. Do you know about that one, Rick? I do not. Oh, See, this really is why good. I show up for these things. Okay. I hadn't thought about that in a while, but the homosaurus is fantastic mm. and it's cute too, which is to me, a big part of it. Greg, are you um, going to save these links so I can get them later? Yeah, we'll save okay. the chat for sure. Okay. Um, Thank you. Those are great. Um, what are, so the Rainbow History Project and others, so there's a field that you can enter stuff in free text. Part of me, I'm a little skeptical because we could always enter stuff into a free text field, you know, but I'm like, this in that way, the system is not prompting you to enter that that data to think about it, right? It's like, you have to be very proactive about adding that stuff. And then typically in the past, things that were hidden in a free text block were sort of hidden from view. They weren't as easily searchable. I think now that's different. Now we're just searching all the text at once. So maybe that's less of an issue. Hmm. 
Um, another comment um, from Samantha Schaefer, we're, we're also including guidelines to respecting creator privacy and how to balance that with inclusive description. Mm. So does that mean that you might uh, gather or create some data about the author's identity that the institution holds, but the that isn't necessarily open to the public? It's a little more protected. You sort of interview the person who's the researchers coming in to see where they're coming from before you reveal all the data. Is that how that works or? I'm sure they're, they're typing or thinking right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions that people are having as, as we're having this discussion? Or comments. Just yeah. what are you, what are you all doing out there in the world? Um, okay, well, in answer to your questions, uh, Rick, uh, sometimes, or we try not to apply labels unless the creator has already applied them to themselves. Um, hmm. So we have another uh, comment uh, question here. I work at a half museum, half archaeological museum in Phoenix. We use Proficio, which has a heavy archaeological basis. You can manually place information, but sadly, there are no queer prompts about the groups or people. I know you have an art background, but does anybody have any recommendations for queering an arche archaeological space? I love that. Yeah, good one. Good, good question for the group. I mean, I'll just add in response to that real quick that the, uh, you know, colleagues who work in non-art museums, uh, I'm thinking of a um, natural history museum in one case, um, you know, part of what they did is they just sort of honored and acknowledged the queer people in their field who've made contributions to the field or queer collectors who have collected and then, you know, donated to the museum. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the author or creator of the artifact. It could have been the donor, could have been the collector. Um. We have a file of obituaries for a trans person. We will name the paper file and online index with their chosen name. Any dead name information is only available in the paper file that a researcher can consult. Yeah. I, I love that as a solution to this, you know, because of, invariably there's going to be resources out there that use the dead name and you need to have that recorded and how to do that respectfully. So that is, um, that is uh, great to see. Yeah, you know, that makes me reflect on sort of, because I was present in the field when museums in particular started to digitize their collections or records and images of the collections and put them online. And, and it was really remarkable because museums, did, or, sorry, libraries did it first. You know, they got there first and started to digitize everything and put it on the internet. You know, I'm talking about the 1990s. And for them, it was a natural outgrowth of what libraries do already. Like their, their records about their collection already were presented to the public in the form of the card catalog, which was right out in front. So their mode of access was the public comes in, here's all the records of their artifacts, and then you look it up and then you go find it. Museums never had that kind of access. They never had that ethos around access. It was always, you see the exhibitions, which are of course highly mediated, and to see the collection, you have to be an institutional affiliate with a scholar with a little letter of introduction, and then we'll let you into the cave and we'll bring out the white gloves and show you. So the everything was always protected in the physical apparatus of the building and was never thought to be sort of widely publicly accessible. And then with the advent of the internet, within like five years, that 200 year tradition just like flipped and museums were like, okay, everything needs to go on the internet. Uh, but I think maybe we're now at a moment where we're past, we're well past the early enthusiasm around the internet. And now it's a big cautionary tale. So I do kind of take the lesson that, yeah, maybe we need to pull some things back from the internet and sort of put them back in the building. Mm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, uh, question here. I think there's a tension between queer community-based archives, which have been collecting materials about our community for some time, and a growing interest from more traditional institutions wanting to to begin collecting queer materials. Can you speak about how these concerns might be approached and worked through to the benefit for all? Oh God, well, uh, I mean, this is this is part of like me doing my little pony show here is like, hey, everybody collect the queer stuff. Um, I think part of what we can do, by we, I mean all of us, but I also mean anyone who's particularly interested in this, 
is to sort of solve some of the problems because what I what I encounter just anecdotally again in the field from colleagues is institutions are very reticent and most of the people in the institutions are not they're, they're not reticent because they just you know they hate queer people and they just want it out of their archive. It's rather the opposite. You know, they're inclusive thinking, but they're very sensitive. And it just goes back to all the topics we've been talking about. They're sort of afraid of doing the wrong thing. So they kind of just hold back and don't do anything. So part of it is, you know, for, for anyone who is modeling, here's how you can do it sensitively. It's important to get that model out there. But I also think like little projects, like developing this language, developing these taxonomies, these folksonomies, these controlled vocabularies that are that allow us to do more. I think that would be a really big step. We need a project around that. Uh, I put my email up here as my last slide, because if anybody's interested in working on that kind of stuff, get in touch. I don't know, maybe we'll write a grant or something like that. But, you know, what I'm saying is if we can sort of attempt to sort of solve some of these blocks to that institutional hesitancy, then, you know, these, these larger traditional institutions might go, oh, okay, it seems like there's a way to do it. One of the things, I just want to add to that, Rick, because one yeah. of the things for me that, um, and, and this, this uh, distinction between like community space and more traditional collecting institutions, um, I'm someone, first of all, I will say I've worked in museums my whole life. I love museums. Um, and now that I've sort of not working in a museum, one of the things that has been really interesting for me. And I think something that we've been having a lot of conversations about um, here at the CCAHA are what materials should go into institutions and what materials shouldn't. Because I think that has historically been the conversation is like, we need to collect all this stuff and put it in our institutional archives. When I think really right now, a lot of folks are having this conversation, which is I think to John's point, like maybe this shouldn't go in a museum. Maybe this should live in a community space in someone's home. Um, and we can work with you regardless of your space to make sure you're doing that due diligence to, uh, to, to preserve that collection. Um, that's sorry. That's kind of my like Ted talk these days, but. Well, um, Greg, Greg, if I could respond to that, I mean, um, yeah. on the one hand, you know, cultural heritage institutions know that it's impossible to collect and, and and describe everything, right? So first of all, there's that. But also, yeah, we always were making curatorial decisions about what what gets in or what gets out. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought about following up on that. Good. Well, let's go ahead and go, go to one of the other. It looks like yeah. you're getting active now. So I think we're, we're getting there. Um, so uh, Maddie says, I will preface this by saying that I haven't used the system and I'm a conservator. But I know that Recollect is a CMS that is geared towards community engagement. Ooh. I know they are looking to answer some of the questions in the context of documenting Indigenous collections. And I wonder if there's some crossover. Yeah. And I think that's great. I think your point earlier in your talk, Rick, about like intersectionality is really important to keep kind of coming back to that. So thank you, Maddie. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Th these are great observations, useful information. Mm hmm um, we have a question. Would it be possible to incorporate queer ecology into an art? Oh, so this is maybe back to our, our archaeology discussion. Queer ecology to an archaeological space. For example, acknowledging plant samples that reproduce in other ways. Interesting. Yes. I love thinking about ginkgo trees are my favorite for that. They're like transgender plants. Okay, anyway. Um Okay, we have another comment here, um, and I, I love this. We're we're talking to each other on this this webinar, so that's great. So, um, Max is saying thank you to Vincent for the comment. That's a good idea. I'm currently the only queer person who works at this museum. Everyone has been very supportive and is interested in some of our ideas how we can positively queer our space. Thank you. Um, and uh, um, another comment from Samantha. I've previously worked with indigenous communities. And um, this is back to John's comment earlier. The biggest thing I've learned from that would would apply to working with queer community archives is to respect the fact that we're not always the best uh, stewards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was that's kind of maybe where I was going to. So um, yeah, I think I think acknowledging that is important. And maybe does that does that kind of get? I I do think it's interesting to consider from your perspective, Rick, as a curator and, and that that question too of like, 
what gets in the museum and what what doesn't or the archive or the library or whatever well, there's so. always that but i remembered the point i wanted to bring up in response to what you were saying earlier and that is you were describing sort of museums as opposed to community spaces and specifically in this case maybe queer community organizations i guess i would try and push back a little bit on the on that line between what yeah, those things sure. are because you know any person who works in a museum well no most people who work in museums nowadays very much think of our spaces as community spaces, right? That public ethos is fundamental to the modern museum. It's part of the, it's part of uh, ICOM's and AM's definition of what qualifies as a museum is it must be open to and serve the general public to some extent. So, and any museum that's, you know, uh, thinking about their community these days is, is working with their proximal community, right? They're geographically proximal neighbors, you know, as well as their larger community of interest. So I don't know if community spaces can do it, so can museums. And I think mm -hmm. most museums are so inclined. That's why I kind of wanted to, I'm leaning into the institutional practice because in some cases, you know, the technical solutions and those kinds of things, they go so far and then they kind of get bound down and it's kind of unclear why they're not being applied. And I think it's because of these institutional practices. So you know, I guess when I'm talking to my peers, I, well, I don't want to sound like I know all the answers, but, you know, say, look, we're community spaces. We can do this work too. We can talk to our communities. We can preserve materials sensitively. We can see what the current language, the non taxonomy of our neighbors is and apply that. We can do all the same things. Um, and, and some museums have a lot more researches or research resources with which to do that too, or partner with community organizations. Anyway, I'm preaching to the choir here. Well, no, but I, I think if I'm going to plug the CCHA for our approach, I need to plug the Samic Art Museum, which I think, to to your credit, Rick, has really done a great job of like being a community space. So I think that's so important to say that. Um, we have another comment here about um, Indigenous collections. So look at uh, Mukartu, which National Archives is currently embracing for community mm -hmm. archives, another resource. Um, and maybe we can, uh, I'm wondering, because um, we're going to send out some um, resources that Rick has prepared, but I think um, it, we, um, we should also probably send out these links that we're crowdsourcing right now. So, um, yes. uh, so Camilla and I, who's on this call, like working on the back end, um, can, can, maybe we can gather those for, for the follow-up email that everybody gets after this. Um, okay, so here's a question. What about, what do y'all do about social geography? How are people tracking the gay use of public space? Softball fields where lesbians gathered, places where ACT UP protests occurred, our actions at non-LGBTQ spaces? Wow, I want to hear more about that. Yeah. But also from everybody, I, the question is really for everybody, so. ArcGIS, I don't know. You know, it's funny, I went to a faculty colloquium here at Bucknell just last night, and there is a person who works in our library, Diane Jakaki, and she just published a book, and it's re it really is about kind of social geography. It's kind of the history of place names and uses. She's focusing on London, but she's also a digital humanist, so she's connecting that to, you know, um, MI, uh, spatial data systems. Okay, so Amy Williams said something. I think they might have just sent it to us in the hosts and panelists chat. So let me make sure that this gets to everybody too. No worries, Amy. Um, but this is querying the map. Fascinating. Um, and we also have um, social geography with uh, nycgbtsites.org. Again, we can um gather all of these resources and 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 add them um to the the email that we send out that'd be great yeah it's so important to sort of make this history explicit i noticed that collection management systems are or you know especially for anthropology and art museums are they're tackling the problem of how to describe different cultures and specifically indigenous cultures and deal with those objects but I noticed that the sort of gender and sexuality elements are, are more often left out. You know, they're sort of left to these traces. I think because they're trickier. It's, it's well, they're not trickier. <laughs> it's just, but it's just as easy to misapply. 
Yeah, Rick, before you got on, just I was joking that Zoom likes to remove my pronouns every time I uh, re-sign into it. So there's some like digital yeah. queer erasure happening. That's right. Uh, there's a question about nonce taxonomy. I, I feel like I can't really, I'm not the person who came up with the term. Um, so I, I mentioned Polari by way of sort of, you know, the secret queer language of early 20th century as a kind of nonce taxonomy. But I would recommend reading, and this will be in the bibliography, I think that that Greg sends out. Um, um, Eve Sedgwick is the scholar who really talks about nonce taxonomies. So I would just recommend looking up, just you know, Google Eve, Eve Sedgwick, nonce taxonomy. Mm, yeah, and then for geography, uh, Vincent is saying we have a map of LGBTQ spaces, but we haven't figured out what to do with straight places where gay things happen. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm I'm again reminded of you know the fact that like it's interesting that we're talking about identifying um, queer spaces, but I would just offer the same observation that as soon as you identify a queer space, by definition, you have straight spaces too. So. I look forward to referring to spaces in the world and on maps as a straight space. This is a straight street. <laughs> like the straight book section. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, just some more great resources coming through in the chat for geography. Um, <laughs> yeah, some, some really great examples here of like gay things happening in straight spaces, like public bathrooms for gay sex, cruising the park in front of the White House. <laughs> yeah, that I think you now those have been referred to as tea rooms, and I'm not sure if tea room was Polari. Polari oh, was basically a bathroom that could be used for cruising. Don't quote me yeah. on that, but I remember that the phrase tea room as one of those sort of known stats on me. Mm, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. And I have another, um, another resource here that I think I might have missed originally, but. Here in Philadelphia, my colleague Bob Skiba, Skiba runs the, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, runs the LGBT mapping project. project um, and John cautions this is best viewed on a desktop. Um, so another resource. This is awesome. Thank this you. This is awesome. Who knew that this was a whole like subfield? Yeah, it's great. Queer spaces, yeah. Um, well, I, I think we're, we're, we're approaching the end of our hour. Um, if there's any more burning questions or um, Rick, I know you had some, some questions for folks here, but this has been such a lovely discussion and such a great um, sort of opportunity to share resources with, with each other and, and connect. So. Um, well, Greg, thank you very much. And thank you for everybody who continues to contribute uh, to the, to the chat too. This is really what I was hoping for is to learn from you all. And I put my email up because I'm 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 genuine about my interest in connecting with all of you. So it just if you just want to shoot me an email and say you were on, if you want to, I don't know, we'll just stay in touch. Nice. I feel like we have a little family of choice here today, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> there, well, uh, thank you so much to the Conservation Center and to you, Greg. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. And and people are are sharing emails in the chat. So that's awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, so make sure to grab those, okay. um, and I will just um, I will just conclude here uh, with just a big thanks to you, Rick, um, and I also want to thank Camilla Dawson, who has been working behind the scenes with all the tech setup for today's webinar. Again, thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the William Penn Foundation, and the Independence Foundation, and really to all of you for showing up today. This has been fabulous. Um, our next webinar is going to be um, archi Activist Archives and Frameworks of Care on January 11th at noon. So we hope to see you there. Um, and for those of you interested in a deeper dive on preservation, we have an upcoming course, an online course on photo preservation and housing with staff from the Harry Ransom Center in Texas. So that's going to be super cool. Um, when this program ends, there's going to be a little survey that will pop up after your window closes. Um, we kindly ask you uh, to fill this out and let us know how you're doing. And I'm just going to like pause for a little bit while people like get each other's emails addresses because this is very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is fa fabulous. I hope everybody has a lovely afternoon and um, 
and I hope you got as much out of it as clearly Rick and I did. So um, uh, we'll hopefully see you at the next one. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.